Welcome back out to the channel. Today we're going to talk about food. And have you noticed if you're trying to change your eating habits, if you're able to do it, how much better you feel afterwards? And then I've got to ask you, are you able to keep that up for a long time? Or is it a few months later you're falling back into your same old routines? Okay, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about that problem with food and then I'm going to give you some ideas uh, for mindful eating on um, what you can do to help you work through those those issues. Hi, my name is Kim. I'm a nationally certified and licensed Chinese medical provider and a Taoist practitioner. Today we're going to talk about food and we're going to talk about some of the things you can do that can get you over the hump of food. What is it about food? right? I mean, we are so obsessed with food. You can look on the web, you can go to your doctor, and all your health issues, they attribute it to food. And if you're overweight, then for sure, all your health issues are about the foods you're eating. And yet, when you try to change your eating habits, the only solution they have is dieting. Well, if you've tried dieting, then you know that doesn't work. And what it does is you might feel really good because you met all your goals, but within six to 12 months, you're right back where you started and you probably have gained a little bit more weight and you're more unhealthy. So the solution that they present to you, I mean, it has like this 90% fail rate within a year after stopping your diet. And yet that's the only solution that they have. Okay, well, let's talk a little bit more about food. I'm going to share with you a couple reasons why foods are so difficult and changing our eating habits is so difficult. What is the most common way that regular medicine wants to help you get healthy? Diets, right? And yet we know now that diets have something astronomical like a 90% fail rate. A 90% fail rate? 90% fail rate? And with a 90% fail rate, they keep on advertising or they keep on pushing them. So just that in and of itself can make you feel like you're kind of set up for failure. But okay, so let's talk a little bit about why you might be set up for failure. And there's a couple of reasons why, and I'm gonna go over three of them. I'm gonna talk about how we use foods today, because it's really different than how we used them at the turn of the 1900s. I'm going to talk about our processing, what we've done differently with processing foods, and then I'm going to talk about the societal pressures of foods. So first let's talk about how we're using foods today. In the 20th century, we've made a big change. We're using foods for convenience and luxury. And that's a really big different game from using foods for nutrition. It changes corporate attitude on what kind of foods they have to put out to market and how they're going to make a profit. And it changes it in really significant way because convenience addresses the fact that there are so many things that you have to do today that you just don't have time. And then luxury addresses the fact that, you know, we are going out to great restaurants having great food. So let's talk a little bit about convenience first because convenience is when you have to get your kids to a soccer game and you just got off work, you just picked them up, you have an hour to get there and the only time that you have is to race through a fast food restaurant, right? It's, that's convenient. Convenience is about being able to pick up pre-packaged foods so that you don't have to chop them all up and make that at home, that's convenience. And convenience is about you being able to sit at your desk and pop open a soda so that you can get a quick burst of energy. That's convenience. And then we have luxury. Being an ex foodie, I know all about luxury and foods. And luxury foods are usually high in sugars, high in fats, and low in nutrition. The, one of the first luxury foods that I've ever read about was white bread. 
So in ancient China, white bread was a luxury because it took 30% more labor to make white bread because they had to not just take off the hull, but they had to take off the germ, and that took about 30% more labor. So it was really expensive to make. Today, everybody can get white bread. And one of the favorites that I grew up with was Wonder Bread. So even today, I still like Wonder Bread, so so sorry about that. But getting whole wheat breads, now that's hard today. And even though it's easier to manufacture, that's hard. And so that's what we talk about when we're talking about luxury and we're talking about convenience. It's about throwing out foods that are easy for you to grab and go, low nutritional value, high in chemical preservatives proce uh, processing, or we're talking about luxury foods, and that's low in nutrition, high in fats and sugars. Now, there's another aspect of why food's complicated today, because we're changing how we're manufacturing foods. And because we're not using foods as nutrition, Corporations have found this to be oh, almost like a free-for-all. So we have a ton of GMO foods. And do you know we don't get to test what GMO foods do in the body here in the United States? All the testing is done overseas. So if you want to know what GMO foods do, does in your body, you've got to find somebody who did the testing outside the United States. And then besides GMO foods, what do we have? What did GMO foods do for us? Well, because they added in uh, weed resistance, guess what happened to our weeds? Our weeds became super weeds. If we look at the amount of herbicides we were using in 1995, we were using about 17 million pounds of glyphosate. In 2016, we were using 250 million pounds of glyphosate. Now you have these, this level of pesticides that's like everywhere. It's in your water, it's on your foods, and you have to be aware of what neurotoxins do in the body. And you don't just have GMOs to deal with. You don't just have pesticides to deal with. You also have all these chemicals that are now added into foods to help preserve it or to help make it taste better or to turn your brain on and turn your brain on to food. We've been taught to think that foods and alcohols are how we socialize with others. So you might want to have a cookout with friends and family, and it's about foods and it's about what you're drinking. If you're doing a diet, guess what? You're going to be saying, oh, I can do the salad and water. But here's the thing. Everybody around you, all your friends and your family, start pressuring you to eat what they're eating or drink what they're drinking, especially with alcohol. If you sit down at a table of everybody drinking alcohol and you go for water, everybody freaks out and they try to pressure you to drink with them. Now I know that using foods or even changing how I eat, that's going to be hard. That's not going to be an easy thing to do. So what can I do to help me make these changes. This isn't easy. I mean, basically they've made us into a whole bunch of little addicts running around. So when you're gonna change, you've got to be smarter than the addiction. That's where I think mindful eating might help. Let's talk about what you can do to change this. And one of the key things you can think about is using mindfulness practices. It's about being present. And what I really like about mindfulness practices is it's not about what you're eating, it's about how you're eating. And that might be the first step into changing your eating, eating habits, right? Because when we focus so much on what we're eating, oh my gosh, it feels like dieting again, right? And when you focus on dieting, that just feels like restriction. And when you are dealing with restriction, when, with something that's about convenience and something that's about luxury, that just really doesn't work. It ignores what food is. And, and of course, it doesn't go, go very well for us. So 
So let's talk about mindful eating practices and some of the things that you can incorporate and why they might help you. Hey, would you like your very own free copy of the 10 easy mindfulness eating tips? To get your free copy, click on the link up here in the corner of the video or click on the link at the end of this video and you can get your very own free copy of 10 easy mindful eating tips. How do you become present when you're eating? Because you're going to find some place where you can sit down and focus on the food that you're eating. Next thing is to become conscious and aware of if you're feeling full or if you're feeling hungry. As you're eating this food, become conscious and aware of how that food makes you feel. Because the foods we're eating have made us so sick that we don't even realize that every day that we eat them, they just make us feel like crap. Starting to become conscious of how food makes you feel is a huge step forward in understanding how food interacts with you. A fourth thing, chewing. Try chewing each bite 25 to 50 times. Now, I started out with 25 times because I was like 50, that sounded like forever. And what I found is it really wasn't we're still chewing like 17 times, which I didn't realize that we were really chewing that much. If we can increase that to 25, I found that you're able to mash up that food pretty good. And if you increase it to 50, that food's mush. And what that does is it pre-digests foods before it gets into your digestive tract, before it gets into your stomach. And if you're an older adult, you know that your stomachs are already pretty weak anyways. So being able to help your digestion is huge. There's four things from mindfulness that can help you improve your interaction with foods. And maybe if you can become more aware of how you're interacting with foods, you can start to change pieces of your food selection one at a time. I hope that gives you some ideas of you know why this is hard. This isn't easy and if you just keep on following regular medicine and you try and fall for that diet scenario, all that's going to do is pull down your confidence, pull down your ability to move forward, pull down your ability to change your health. So think about what's happening with food today, how that's impacting you, and here's some ideas. Take some mindfulness practices to start changing how you're interacting with it and see if that over the long term, not over the next month or two months, which is how long your diet's going to last, but over the long term, if that doesn't help you change how you interact with food. Okay, until next time, I'll catch you on the other side.